right, welcome everyone. My name is Morgan Lomley. I'm the Director of State and Local Policy at People for Bikes. Hello. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you'll hear from me a lot today, but I'm going to turn it over to Larry Peasy, who chairs the People for Bikes e-bike subcommittee and who's been the leader of this e-bike initiative for the last five years to welcome you all and say a few words. Um, a lot has happened in five years. Um, and, you know, in actuality, uh, this last year has been uh, just totally unprecedented, uh, the progress that we've made. We now have 23 states that have adopted our model uh, three-class e-bike legislation. Um, and that's allowed e-bikes to proliferate um, from coast to coast. Uh, it's actually um, a little less than 60% of um, the population in the United States are affected by the C-bike legislation. And um, currently we're actively working on about 33% uh, in the remainder of 2019 and, and plan to work on in 2020. 14 more states are on our docket uh, for, for next year and the, and the remainder of this year. And um, of the 22 most populous states, 14 now have our uh, three-class legislation. E-bikes are and have been for the last handful of years the fastest growing category. Um, the compound annual growth rate of e-bikes um, from 2016 to 2018 has been about 95% in units and 83% in dollars. That's huge. And if you look at the uh, data that we get, that we publish from People for Bikes, uh, from NPD on the specialty segment, in 2019, the, for the first time, uh, e-bikes will be a mainstream product, more than 15% of total revenue of our industry. Um, more and more people are adopting uh, e-bikes for, for real transportation. Um, and uh, it's great to see it uh, proliferate. If you're not familiar with People for Bikes, People for Bikes is equal parts bike industry trade association and foundation. So Alex and I and my colleague Ashley and Eric and a number of us work strictly on the association side. So our job is to help the bike industry thrive by promoting a lot of these lessons, promoting these networking opportunities, being of service to the bike and the e-bike industries. Um, on the foundation side, we donate hundreds, or <laughs> hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars every year to charitable causes that get better biking on the ground. So our mission is to get more people riding bikes more often, and a natural progression of that is promoting e-bikes and making sure that e-bikes are an accessible form of transportation and recreation for as many people as possible. So it's been a really fun evolution of our work. This is a picture of my children. I miss them. But I've been riding an e-bike for four and a half years, and I've logged about 6,000 miles on two separate e-bikes. So I always tell kind of my story. When, when I first started this work about five years ago, some of you have heard this before, the thought of a motor on a bicycle was mortifying. It's like, I, I have a lot of bicycles in my garage. None of them have a motor. I don't need a motor. I'm in my 30s. But I had these children and they get heavier and heavier every year and it's really hard to continue to ride them up the hill to my house and an e-bike has changed the way that I think about transportation in our cities. It's changed the way that I think about getting my family around town, raising my family and so one thing, I'm sure you all think about this night and day and we all live and breathe e-bikes but e-bikes aren't just for recreation, they're not just for a Saturday morning ride for transportation and one of the shifts I want to help make and Karin will help us do this later in the morning is how do we get more people to think about not driving and how do we get more people to think about carrying things and, and families and groceries on their bicycle and shifting our American mindset of just bicycling for recreation and that's one of the lessons I wanted to leave you all with today it's you can have 12 bikes in your garage you can ride every day uh, for recreation but the transportation aspect is really the untapped opportunity for the industry and for the U.S. population. So those are my very cute children. That's our awesome bike. We're, all, we're not competitors today. Don't worry about the brand. But um, it's, a, it's been a real eye-opener for me, and it's, it's really helped me um, become as passionate as I can about this work. So you saw Larry and I 
we're remiss in not presenting this slide, but these are the companies that have supported this work. We raised over a million dollars to fund my work, Alex's work, People for Bikes work, to, to, do the, to make the progress that I'll present in just a minute. So I want to give a special round of applause to these companies and thank you from the bottom of my heart for your generosity. All right, e-bike laws and regulations, my favorite topic. Um, the reason why five years ago I started this work with Alex and a number of people in this room is because e-bike laws were different in every single state. So imagine driving a car from Nevada to California. The laws that apply to you as the driver of that vehicle are pretty much the same. Imagine riding your bike from Connecticut to New Jersey or, or wherever. The laws are pretty much the same. The opposite was true for e-bikes. So you could ride your bike from California to Oregon and you were suddenly subject to different laws that applied to how your bike was defined, um, where you could ride, what the different regulations were that applied to you. Our goal is so that someone can ride an e-bike from state to state to state, buy it from state to state to state, and you can ride it under the same laws and regulations. What, let's step back a little bit. At the federal level, the laws for e-bikes have been pretty much set since 2002. So the federal government tells manufacturers what their product needs to look like, how it needs to be assembled, etc. cetera. Um, they decide what the laws are for manufacturing and for sale. So the federal laws around e-bikes don't really pertain to where you can ride it. But it's an important distinction to make and it's important to understand that at the federal level, e-bikes are generally defined as bicycles, so long as they meet these criteria. They're pedal or throttle assist bikes. The upper wattage is 700, the limit for wattage is 750 watts. The maximum speed under motor power alone is 20 miles an hour. But the gray area, and this was codified in 2002, so it's already 17 years old, but the gray area is there's no upper limit for the, speed, the top assisted speed for a bike under human and motor power alone. So it's not a perfect law, but in essence, for the purpose of first sale and manufacturing, an e-bike is a bicycle. And this doesn't, again, this isn't applicable to where you can ride on the roads, on bike paths, on single track, but for the purpose of first manufacturing, or first sale and manufacturing, an e-bike is a bike. So that's really great news, and that helped lay the framework for some of the work we do at the state level. So state policies, as I mentioned, every single state has its own vehicle law. About five, four and a half years ago, the bike industry realized that it needed to almost self-police on where an e-bike started and where it stopped, and then where a motorcycle or other kind of device started. So we sat down, and a number of us in this room had months of long conversations around how do we classify our products so that the state departments of transportation, cities and counties, trust that the product we're making is used like a bike, is consistent with the, that federal standard that I just showed you, and we're not confused with motorcycles. So we developed the three classes, and I'll show that to you in a second, and if you manufacture bikes, e-bikes, I'm sure you're familiar, but our, our goal was so that e, the three classes of e-bikes were recognized and defined at the state level, and ultimately, the riders of those three classes of e-bikes were allowed to ride wherever they could ride a bicycle in general. So we've been successful in defining the three classes of e-bikes in 23 states so far, and... Um, another, gosh, 16 generally defined e-bikes like bikes, but not within the three classes. Our goal, obviously, is to get to all 50. So class one, uh, <laughs> preaching to the choir here, pedal assist only. You have to pedal to engage the motor. The motor will shut off at 20. And again, that's not an average speed. That's the speed at which the motor will shut off. Uh, class two is throttle assist. And we get a lot of questions. Like if it's, th if it's a throttle assist bike and you don't have to be pedaling, is it a bicycle? Well, the reality is, under that federal definition, a Class 2 e-bike is defined as a bicycle, very explicitly. The other reality is, is there are suppliers of Class 2 e-bikes that are selling e-bikes to people who enjoy riding them, and they would like to be afforded the same rights to the road as the rider of a Class 1 or 3 bike and a rider of a bike. So let's acknowledge that this product exists and build it within our system rather than leave major flaws within the class system. Class three is a pedal assist bike. The maximum assisted speed is 28 miles an hour. So these generally are consistent with that federal definition. The one flaw in the federal definition is, again, there's no upper limit for the speed under motor and human power alone. So there's not that 28 mile top assisted, motor assisted speed. Our hope down the road is there is consistency with the laws for manufacturing and the laws for ridership at the federal and state levels, but 
we felt like it was a good call to limit that upper upper assisted speed, especially consistent with what's sold and used in Europe. These the states in green are the states where we've passed the three classes of e-bikes. Um, again, 23 states now have this three-class law, which is an incredible landmark, coast-to-coast, -coast, bipartisan accomplishment for the industry, not possible without those contributions to fund this work. But we're really making change in how this product that we all want to sell and want people to ride is, is recognized at the state level. It's a huge accomplishment. We still have work to do. The states in yellow generally define e-bikes, generally within the framework of that federal definition. So e-bikes are bikes, but they don't define the classes. And what we want over the next couple years is to turn this whole map green. One really important factor in these state laws is that every single one of those 23 states requires the e-bike to be sold with a sticker on it that says what the class is, what the top wattage is, and what the maximum assisted speed is. Available research. So we, thanks to the University of Tennessee and University, or, sorry, Portland State University, John MacArthur's in here. Um, we've developed quite a library of research and statistics and what we know now about e-bikes and where they work, where they don't work, um, what happens when you allow them on bike paths or single track trails. So this is a resource for the industry. All of you are, are, are really pounding the pavement, selling e-bikes, making them, broadening the demographics, broadening the customer base. And you probably get a lot of these questions too. What do we know? So use our resources at our stats library to learn about rider demographics. There's a new study um, about the differences between class one and class three e-bikes from a safety perspective and a speed perspective. The health benefits of biking, that, research, that body of research is growing every single day. E-bike incentive programs. If you have a city that comes to you as a supplier and wants to partner on e-bike purchase incentives, you know, what are other cities doing? What are other counties doing? Perceptions around EMTB use, class one EMTB use studies. So this is more of a resource to you all for you to easily point to studies that are defensible, that are data-driven, and that help us make the case that e-bikes get people outside. They're generally used like bikes, that there are lots of health benefits, et cetera. Probably the most exciting thing that came out of state legislators, state legislatures this year outside of e-bikes, uh, e-bike policy, is purchase incentives. So we're, there's a, there are a lot of uh, electric vehicle purchase incentives and maybe some tax rebates, things like that when you buy an electric car. Or in, in California, for example, you know, their, their cash for clunkers program. So looking at ways to in, either incorporate an e-bike purchase into some of these programs that incentivize electric vehicle purchase or creating new programs that get people uh, a little bit of a rebate or purchase incentive off of um, the cost of their e-bike. So California actually had the first program that we've ever seen to take some of the existing funding for clunkers, you know, old gas guzzling cars, and using that to incentivize the purchase of e-bikes. And the number of people in California who are eligible is relatively small, but it's really the first of its kind, and it's something that People for Bikes will be focusing on pretty thoroughly to try to get cash for people who want to buy an e-bike for transportation purposes. So again, shifting beyond recreation into transportation so that we paint e-bikes not just as a sport, but as a mobility solution and um, kind of an all-encompassing solution to people who don't want to drive a car, for example. So California State Bill 400. Um, Linda from CalBike is here. Linda, can you... Linda spearheaded this. If you have questions about taking this to your state or broadening it within the state of California, huge props to CalBike for spearheading this and, and making it happen. So these are the little wins we need to paint e-bikes as mobility solutions and to incorporate them into cities and use that as leverage to build better bike infrastructure, to make people feel safer on the road and get more people riding bikes. These are all the little wins that add up to getting more people on e-bikes. All right, so everybody's favorite recent topic, trade and tariffs. Uh, certainly a very active part of the policy world and something we've had to really spend a lot of time working on at People for Bikes over the last two years or so, um, as we've had uh, quite a bit of conflict um, from key import countries. So let's just dive right in. Uh, a few things I want to cover today. 
So the first thing, Section 301 tariffs. I'll just do a little bit brief background um, for either refresher or for those of you who haven't followed it quite as closely. Um, round one started in July 2018. The only product from our industry that was really getting hit at that point in time was GPS units, and those were subject to a 25% tariff increase. Um, that 25% again is ad valorem over the existing rate. So if the current rate is 3%, the 25% rate jumps it to 28. It's not like 25% of the existing rate. So they're very significant tariff increases, as I'm sure you've all experienced. Um, round two was the one that hit e-bikes. That went into effect August 23rd, 2018, and that included e-bikes and e-bike motors. Um, e-bikes are not classified similar to bicycle um, similar to bicycles or other bicycle products under the United States Harmonized Tariff Schedule, they're actually classified under the motor vehicle section of that, so they are, are in a different uh, heading of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule. Round three was where our industry felt the biggest uh, effect of these tariff increases. Round three moved in a couple different stages, first a 10% increase in September 2018, then that was later bumped up to a 25% increase in May 2019, and that was where all complete bikes, other than e-bikes, uh, were subject to that higher tariff. And that included uh, probably most, you know, I would think probably more than 50% of our component imports as well. Round 4A was the most recent one from September of this year. That was only a 15% increase. Um, and that hit all of our remaining components and also lights and helmets, which had previously been removed from list three after we advocated for the removal. And then round 4B um, had been suspended. I just saw in the news this morning that um, President Trump was saying that if we don't hit, um, if the United States doesn't reach a trade deal with China prior to December 15th, that those tariffs will go through. Um, we'll see what that threat materializes uh, to be as we get closer to that date. Um, but those are on hold for the moment, but could, uh, could move if um, trade talks don't progress. What's the financial burden so far? Um, it's very significant tariff increases, I noted before. Our industry already faces pretty high tariffs to begin with, especially on complete bikes. So those complete bikes come in at an 11% tariff, um, and then the 25% tariff bumps that up to 36%. Most goods imported into the United States faced a, a tariff of more like 2 or 3%, so our tariffs are quite significant to begin with. I went and ran the numbers um, from October 2018 through September 2019, so one full year, for all of the import headings for which we have readily available data that's collected by customs um, on imports from China to see like what the rough additional contribution that we're making as a result of these tariffs is, and that's $125 million. So obviously that is a low number because I can't break down all of the imports, you know, especially for soft goods. Um, shoes, things like that, e-bikes, I can't break that number down because of the import codes. So our, our real number is obviously higher than that, that's sort of a minimum, but that gives you a good idea of how much money we've actually ended up contributing to the United States Treasury since these tariffs went into effect. Some of you know I came from about five years at the International Mountain Bicycling Association, so as we were doing all of this work on the state vehicle code side of things, the question of, well, what do we do about electric mountain bikes came about and because of my background on, in mountain bike advocacy, it was a kind of a natural fit for me to get stuck with that really hard problem. Electric mountain bikes. So if, uh, for example, California in 2015 passed a three-class e-bike law, that has, uh, some people in this room might argue with me, that has absolutely no bearing on whether you can ride your electric mountain bike in a local park, uh, on trails, in a state park, in, on forest service property in California. It's completely separate. So local, state, and federal policies around electric mountain bike use all vary depending on the agency. Um, on federal lands, there are a number of agencies that govern uh, mountain bike use, and most of those agencies define e-bikes as motor vehicles. So on federal lands, e-bikes are allowed to go where a motorized vehicle can go. And on state and local lands, it really varies. You know, Colorado State Parks allows class one and class two in all 42 state parks, wherever a bike is allowed. California State Parks, access is much more limited and they don't recognize the classes. They don't, they're thinking about it and they have for five years, but um, it really varies based on the state. I'll give you some more specifics here in a second. Our position at People for Bikes and as part of our e-bike committee has been that the rules governing electric mountain bike use are outdated and they don't respond to what the current product is, the way that people use it, the way that people buy it, and ex that what their desired experience is. 
And regardless of where you allow electric mountain bikes, the current definitions that govern their use are outdated. So we've really been trying to work with agencies to update that. So what, what has happened? So on August 30th, the Department of Interior, and I'll scoot back right here, but these four agencies are Department of Interior. The four services, the uh, Department of Agriculture, it's governed under completely separate regulations. On August 30th, the Department of Interior said, you know, we want you four agencies to update your regulations so that you define e-bikes either within these classes or consistent with that federal regulation, and you generally try to allow these e-bikes where bicycles are allowed on non-motorized trail systems. Um, so that was Secretarial Order 3376, and then the Park Service was the first agency to update their policies. So updating a policy is separate than updating the way they define e-bikes within their regulations, but they're able to do both um, in, as part of parallel processes. So that secretarial order is directed each of those land management agencies to make new policies to expand e-bike access. And if you read the secretarial order, I mean, it, the wording isn't, it, it, it's, it's not hard to read it and get excited. They use things like, you know, we want to get more Americans outside on public lands recreating. We want to increase transportation options, relieve congestion. So the, the wording they use is rather inspirational and coming from, a, from high above like that, it, it's a great sign for us. You might, I mean, this was covered pretty significantly in the media. You might have read a couple things that were wrong or, or right. So what it does not do, it doesn't open up all Department of Interior lands to e-bikes. You can't automatically ride your class one, two or three e-bike anywhere you can ride a bike on park service property or Bureau of Land Management. And we'll hear more from land managers later on today. Um, it doesn't apply broadly to motorized devices or vehicles. It doesn't apply to wilderness areas. So wilderness areas are off limits to bikes in the first place, and they're certainly off limits to e-bikes. So it has no bearing on wilderness areas. And it doesn't apply to the Forest Service. I showed you that Forest Service is a completely different agency. So if you want, I mean, we get a lot of questions, like what can I do? How can I influence how can I show that there's a user group who wants to ride here? How can I engage with my local uh, superintendent or National Park Service unit? Um, do some research. Use People for Bikes as a resource, but do some research on is there a Park Service unit in your area? Do they currently allow bikes? If they don't currently allow bikes, it's kind of a non-starter whether they'll allow e-bikes, but do they currently allow bikes? Are there people who want to ride there? Land managers have a million things to think about. Overflowing toilets, people drowning in reservoirs, you know, tragedies, things that are real public safety or land management issues. And they, I've often heard from land managers, any day I get to talk about e-bikes or think about bikes is, mostly bikes, not e-bikes, is a, is a fun day for them. So understand that it's not their priority, but they do have this policy directive to implement, and they also want to hear from the people using those public lands. So the, the Department of Interior has done a pretty good job of communicating what the directives are and the secretarial order, order is, and, but we've built, still been getting a lot of questions from riders on where can I ride, what does this mean for my ride, what does this mean for that park in this area. So we've been trying to catalog to the best of our abilities all those resources and put that out for the industry and riders to use as a resource. So that's that's all here, and it's, it's updated on a very regular basis with, um, with kind of like, what, you know, what's Yosemite doing? What, what's Arches doing? What are, what's this BLM unit doing? As soon as we hear something in the news or through our contacts, we try to keep that up to date. So trying to be a resource for all this confusing material and, and putting the clarifying information in one spot. We're going to keep on talking about electric mountain bikes. Joe Vadabancourt spent three decades at Trek. I invited him to speak today because after departing Trek and really working on e-bike product development in his latter years there, and he moved into advocacy and started a small business consulting firm called Good Heart Solutions, and now is the executive director, president of the Shalmigan Mountain Bike Association. And so Joe has a really interesting background working on the product side and now working on the advocacy side and really grappling with electric mountain bike issues on a daily basis. And so I think in terms of kind of following our theme here of lessons for the industry from the other side of the coin, I think Joe has a lot of great things to offer. I spent three decades at Trek. I did all of those jobs uh, and a number of other things. I left there about a year and a half ago and started a little consulting business, mostly brand development, 
uh, and, and business development. And I joined the board at a little organization called CAMBA, the Schwamigan Area Mountain Bike Association. Uh, and I'm a community advocate there. And at the second board meeting, music was playing and everybody stopped and sat down. There wasn't a chair for me and they all pointed at me and said, you should be board president. So I think that's how you become board president at one of those places. Um, but by, by way of definition, what is CAMBA? So Schwamigan Area Mountain Bike Association was started in 1993, this little infographic. Uh, to tell you who we are, we have actually about 300 miles of gravel routes that we've mapped. We have 135 miles of single track, 15 trailheads, and we groom, we live in the snow part of the world, so we groom about 70 miles of that for single track bike riding. Anyone that's lived in the Midwest, if you haven't had a chance to come to our neck of the woods and ride, either your mountain bike or your fat bike, shame on you. Um, it's small. So talking to Susie uh, from San Diego, and she talks about numbers. Well, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere, so we're super proud that we have 25,000 people come and ride at our trails. We live in a town with about 2,500 people. And so a $16 million impact to that town is huge. But why do we care? Why does Canva care? We're in the middle of nowhere. We have single track. We have a pure kind of backcountry mountain bike experience in the Midwest. Well, we care because what we care about, what I care about, is creating a great rider user experience. We're, get, we're seeing them on, them on the trail. We have no policy around it. But of course, people buy them, put them on their car, drive them there, and ride them there. Um, we get lots of questions about the access. The forest service that we operate, we're in three different county forests and the national forest and two different private landowners. They all get questions. Can I ride my e-mountain bike there? Guess who they call next? Either me or the executive director of our organization to say, can we, should we? Um, and last but not least, um, all of you care about it. And so many of you come from a company that sponsors our little organization or an event in our part of the world, and you care about it. So we get pressure from our sponsors. So what have we done? So I left Trek, joined the board, moved up to this little tiny community, said we should have you mountain bikes on our trails. That's what all of us would do who, who take the path that I chose. Morgan gave me a bunch of feedback. This is how you should go about making this decision. And so we did it. We did informal sessions with a bunch of users in sort of a town hall format with our members. We held demos for all of our land managers. We had a lot of conversations at the board level and our membership level. And we held a bunch of uh, meetings like this one that I've attended or, or some of our board members have attended to try and make some decision about this. And through all of that, I've come up with what I think is a list of issues or a list of questions that either have not been ad adequately answered or have been ignored altogether by the industry. And remember, I'm pointing at myself because two years ago I was in the same room. Um, but what, what I've learned is just how disconnected the industry is from advocates themselves, the people that actually put trails on the ground and how we don't understand as an industry exactly how that happens. How does a trail get on the ground? Two years later as an advocate, I can answer that for you. Two years ago, I had an idea about it, but I didn't really understand it. And then how rushed and ahead of ourselves we can get, and that's the ready, fire, aim process that I'm describing there. My example of that is we just listened to Morgan say, how do we get e-mountain bikes approved on trails? And I actually think we haven't answered, should they be approved on trails first? Trouble with e-mountain bikes, as I titled it. It's on my little blog site. A bunch of people found it. It got spread around. Morgan ended up with it. She called me and said, how would you like to come here and present that? So the f these are questions or a summary of issue. So some of them are a question that we need to answer. Some of them are just a summary of, of some issue or some topic. First one is, as Morgan said, we have a very dated piece of data that says whether or not e-mountain bikes do more damage on trails than, than mountain bikes. Now, I've ridden one, I've owned them, you've ridden them, you own them. We all kind of know intuitively that they probably don't do more damage. The probably word is there, is the problem. 
what we need is we need real research that shows us that. I'm going to go through that in a minute. That's our first issue. Our second one is how do the trails need to change if we have e-mountain bikes going at a different pace than a standard bike? Again, Morgan pointed to some documentation that's a bit dated, that doesn't have a lot of data and research behind it. But when you're doing this presentation with a bunch of land managers, and I've done this, and they say, Joe, do we need to change the trails? I don't know how to answer that. I can tell them what I think. I think that's a non-legal person's legal opinion, right? Is that what you said? I can tell them what I think, but there isn't a piece of data to point to, a piece of research that says, this is how trails should be designed, and this is how we know that. This is a, you can see it very well, this is a picture of our trails. We have, in the summertime, you can imagine it's all green forest, and it all grows in, it's about this wide. It's you're ripping along down the trail at eight miles an hour with no sightliner on the trail on a two-way trail. Well, at eight miles an hour, that's one level of challenge. At 15 miles an hour, that's a different level of challenge. I don't know if people ride faster on e-bikes, again, because we don't have any real research that tells us that. We think we know, but we don't have real data, real research. And one of the National Forest Service managers that were in the Schwamigan National Forest said to me, I've seen this movie before, Joe. It's called ATVs versus UTVs. So this is an ATV, this is UTV. I didn't know what these were before either. Um, <laughs> But they built trails in the national forest for ATVs. And ATVs were 48 inches wide and went 40 miles an hour. UTVs are more than 70 inches wide and go 100 miles an hour. And so they, this is a land manager looking at you saying, isn't this the same thing? These, you're telling me these, that you ride this trail at six or eight miles an hour, but you're telling me that bike will go 20 miles an hour? Doesn't that mean people will ride 20 miles an hour? I don't know, but he says, I've seen this movie before. It's, it's called UTVs and ATVs. I'm gonna get somewhere with this in a moment. All right, not a question at this point, but it's a, an issue that it, this room needs to be aware of. The only way trails happen is a relationship between an advocate and a land manager. It has nothing to do with this room. <laughs> you can throw all kinds of money at it any way you want. But if you don't have an advocate with a really good relationship with a land manager, the trail doesn't happen. And so I'm the advocate now who the industry would love to see my trails, or our trails rather, opened up to e-bikes. But because I don't want to risk that relationship with this land manager for next year when I want to build a standard mountain bike trail, I'm unwilling to stand up for it without a bunch of data put in my hands. Another point, number four, is Funding for trails is a difficult, difficult challenge. <clears throat> so, Canva has a budget of about $250,000. We spend about $110,000, $120,000 on the trails themselves. So we have another $110,000 to $130,000 that are administrative, uh, running events, whatever we're doing. But in fact, about half of that $120,000, $130,000 is spent to chase money to fund the overall organization. We do that in a lot of ways, and one of the ways we do is we chase every single grant we can get our hands on, including ones that might limit where we can put any mountain bike in the future. I can tell you right now, that 135 miles of trail that Canva has built and maintains, we've probably gotten about $250,000 of money that came to us in a non-motorized grant format. I don't know where it went. I can't say it's that mile got, we spent it there, but not not on this mile, so how do I go back to this agency and say, this motorized group though is okay. <laughs> that motorized group is who we didn't want to be with. All right, and then this one came out in a number of formats already today, and I'm just gonna <coughs> say it bluntly. Class one USA e-mountain bikes are too powerful. They shouldn't be as powerful as they are. How do I know that? I've ridden one, they're great fun, but I've also done demos with land managers and demos with membership members at Canva who are not riders. And you put them out on the bike and inevitably they put it on the turbo mode and they come back scared as shit. <laughs> they come back like, oh my God, this thing just launched out from underneath me in the middle of a turn as soon as I pushed on the pedal. They are frankly 
too powerful. I don't understand wh how we got here. I do understand. But I can't really explain this to a land manager about when they, somebody says to me, well, in Europe, aren't they 250 watt motors and go 15 miles an hour? And here they go 20. Why do we need to go 20? I don't have an answer for that. Then the next thing they say is, and what's to stop them from getting more powerful and faster in the future? I ran product development at Trek for a long time, and I can tell you 100% nothing. <laughs> in fact, this is what's going on now. This is a current advertisement for a bike that says, so powerful they need an air intake. This is a new advertisement in the leading, the leading tagline, more power, less weight. This is something I found the other day online. It's a company called UBCO, never heard of them before. This is a 1500 watt motor, has a top speed of 40 miles an hour, has pedals on it, Sir, surely looks like an e-mountain bike to me, and I work in the industry. To a land manager, they can't tell the difference between any of these, and how the hell are we gonna keep these guys off the single track? We don't have an answer for that. And in fact, I can tell you right now that Pinkbike is gonna review somebody's e-bike and say, Brand X e-bike is 15% faster than brand Y e-bike. And guess what is going to happen with brand Y e-bike the following year? I know, because I would have been in that chair. All right, and then the last question is a funding. I'm taking this opportunity around e-bikes to talk about funding for trails. So trails cost a shitload of money. I don't know if you've ever seen this amount. I was floored when I took over in this organization. To build this mountain bike trail, this one, a lot of dirt, it's on a slope, was probably about five bucks a foot. We build trails at Canva for about three and a half to seven. If it's really rocky, really slope, jump style trail, it's more like seven. And then we spend a dollar per foot every four year on maintenance because you have rain washes it out, you have all these people on it, the rocks come up, the roots come up, you gotta cut the trees back, trees fall down. Our maintenance budget comes out to about a dollar per foot every four years. It's a huge amount of money for an organization that has one paid employee, a dedicated board president, five other board members who are participating, and then a bunch of volunteers. We all say this is going to bring a ton more people to mountain biking. God, that'd be great. I'd love it if it did. But if it drives this number up that we need more, Canva has $110,000 to spend on trails every year. I don't know where that money's gonna come from. Okay, so I was driving along last week, my wife said, well, how the hell are you gonna get people to go from, what the F, Joe, I mean, come on, it's just like, you know, stop being so dramatic. So I said, well, okay, your reaction, if I was in your chair, this is what I'd say, I'd say your first reaction is, oh, come on, e-mountain bikes don't do any more damage to trails than pedal bikes do. Really, seriously, come on. That's the first one, and you want, to, you want to go back to your email or start reading your Instagram or whatever at this point because you're like, ah, write this guy off. Your second reaction is, okay, stop being so dramatic, Joe. Good God. It helps a bunch more people into cycling, and you're, you're right. You actually write about both of these points, by the way, and hopefully you get to, all right, what do we do about this? I've got four solutions that I'm going to offer. You never ask, never get in front of somebody without asking for the sale, right? Okay. The solution is you're the industry, I'm the advocate. There's some land managers in the room as well. So what I'm asking for is for the industry to do some things about this. First point is what should the industry do? Number one, the industry needs to fund and develop. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Industry needs to put regulations around itself, around power. We have to solve this today. We can't let this get out of hand where one day there's a 1500 watt pedal electric mountain bike on the trail and all the trails are getting shut down because we can't control it. We can't just say, oh, class one's, there's a sticker on the down tube, that's plenty. Who the hell's gonna measure that and watch that anyway? So we have to figure out what we're gonna do to limit the power of e-mountain bikes. I would prefer and I think there's a few other advocate types and land managers in the room who might agree. I actually think that we need to create a different class. Class one on the road is too powerful. 
I would like to see is create a trail class, something like that, that brings the power down, brings it down to a 15 mile an hour vehicle so that it's a little more manageable. Second point, what, does, what should the industry do? Here's the point I was making. The industry needs to finance the date, collecting the data and the research so that us as trail advocates can do our job with the land managers to build more access. And specifically what we need is we need more studies on more different types of trails in more different parts of the world. A dry, rocky trail in Idaho has no bearing to the land manager in northern Wisconsin dealing with black dirt and rain and mud and roots. We need data that's relevant to the trail that the advocate and the land manager are talking about. Then if the trails need to change, then we need to clearly publish how they should change. So if they have to get wider, like the example with UTVs and ATVs, if they have to have better sight lines, all of those things, we need that data and we need to publish it and talk about it publicly. Again, taking my opportunity to talk about funding. So I said I live in a little town of 2,500 people. It snowed 24 inches on Saturday. The snowmobilers are crazy at this point at home. But I'm super jealous of my counterparts in the ATV, the snowmobile, fishing, and a bunch of other industries that have a pay-to-play mechanism. So the, AT, the person that manages the ATV trails, which we have hundreds of miles of those as well, in our part of the world. They get money back from the state through licensing. Uh, the snowmobile club gets it as well and they use that money to maintain and build trails. We get none of that in the mountain bike world. I don't know of any state out there that gets that. If there is, I'm moving because that's the state I want to be at. Um, but we don't get any of that in our part of the world. It's all, I call up somebody at Pivot, somebody at Trek, somebody at QBP, beg for a bike and then I raffle it off and I use that money to go back into the trails. Okay, number four, getting a little uh, less direct and a little more, this is what I see might be wrong with the industry. We gotta stop showing people shredding. It's driving me freaking batty. This is how people ride. I've been on trails, you've been on trails. This is this girl with her bike and small little rock feature that she's going over. That's how people ride. But yet, this is what we show. This is somebody coming down out of the book cliffs, I think, in Fruta, just shredding the shit out of that trail. And if you're a land manager looking at this, you're going, oh, that's an e-bike? That's who we want? By the way, this is a KTM e-motorcycle. Their promotional video, that's a screen grab, and that's a screen grab from another competitor or another bike brand. Um, if I showed these to a land manager, if there's any land manager in the room, and I showed these to you, you'd say, I'd say, tell me the difference. Tell, tell me the difference here. They, they all look at it and say, I don't know. It's like that guy's beating the hell out of the trail. It looks like that guy's beating the hell out of the trail to me. And they'd be right. And so I've said that out loud a few times. Like, can we just stop showing people shredding on mountain bikes? It's not, nobody, statistically, nobody shreds. Literally. I mean, you've been on a trail. Statistically, people don't shred. They pedal, they ride, they talk about their Strava time going uphill. They don't do this kind of thing. Yet we love it. All right, number five. This is a pet peeve of mine. I've talked to so many people who say, okay, but it's not a motor. It's, it's a small motorized unit, for fuck's sake. It's a motor. <laughs> it's, a, it's a motor. Anybody a product manager and deal with Bosch's catalog? This has a part number that's described as motor. They're motorized vehicles. Get over it. Let's just figure out how we're going to deal with that. And then I put on the bottom, stop saying they're just like motorcycles. Well, they're really not. They're, they're sort of, I'm going to start saying they're, stop saying they're bicycles. They're, they're kind of bicycles, but they're also kind of motorcycles. So It's too pronged here. You know, we did this study five years ago at one location, and clearly it's not enough. Um, and to echo what Joe did said in his uh, presentation, we need more information on the impacts of mountain biking. I've argued it anecdotally with, you know, members of Congress and advocates, et cetera, and we just go around and we end up at the same table. I look at it in two ways. We need short-term 
um, research right now, and we can do that with our trail solutions teams and others. And we also need long-term research. We need a five year out um, to look at this, these impacts. Because just doing it over 500 you know, runs in one day, you're like, okay, what about five years? What about three years? And I think the federal government actually is in a really good position to do that, not to put everything on you guys, but um, to somehow fund uh, you know, the BLM or, or Forest Service to conduct these studies on a long-term basis, we can really get a good idea of what not only EMTBs are impacting the trail, but what our mountain bike uh, impacting the trail. That leads to better trail design. Um, I'm actually gonna twist things around and, and take on a different angle, uh, kind of on some conversation I've heard from the group today representing the BLM as well as the Forest Service. Um, as uh, Morgan mentioned, we are undergoing law changes right now it is happening um, I believe the Forest Service is just watching the BLM but with changes in law come opportunity for the public and members of the industry to tell us what they think about the direction that we're going and so with the BLM and right now within the next year you're gonna have an opportunity to publicly comment on law changes that will affect e-bikes on our trails or not on the trails um, so please keep an eye out for that opportunity with the, for, with the BLM now and I anticipate with the Forest Service in um, the coming time because we really need to know if we're getting this right or if we're getting it wrong. Uh, I can take that one uh, to start and maybe Joe can add on because he did mention kind of a pay for play idea like is going on with off-road vehicles and other things for a long time as far as permitting. There are examples of that around the country. You go to Sedona, you have to buy a Red Rocks Pass. Most people are probably familiar. Here in our, our US Forest Service, we buy adventure passes. A lot of places have that um, on federal property. Uh, I think in a situation like San Diego, it's a great idea. Um, it's just the management of it. When we have a place in San Diego where I'm dealing with 20-ish different jurisdictions, land managers and agencies, how, how would you do that in a cohesive, way uh, that's a that's a challenge um, our we do have a, a Holland Beck Canyon here out in East County is managed by CDFW it's a wildlife area and you have to have a permit to uh, be able to ride there so it's already in place in some areas it's just a matter of doing it in a cohesive way and to add the education component would be great but how do you do that over multiple jurisdictions is a challenge so I was like what's an e-bike Honestly, as a land manager, I'm, I heard somebody said, oh, we've got e-bikes on the trails. Like, what's an e-bike? All I had in my mind was that little motor, that, you know, like a motor scooter. And I was like, no, we have to keep those things off. So e-bikes came out before we were even aware what they were. So I think from an industry standpoint, maybe it's through people for bikes. When, before you make something <laughs> and throw it out there in the world, Find out where you can, you know, can we use it? What, let people know it's coming who aren't just in your, so maybe it's a media thing. And then what should we all do? All of us, not just the industry. God, I'm so tired of the haters telling the e-mountain bike, <laughs> telling the e-mountain bike users that they suck and the, and the proponents telling the, the people to get over it that one day you're gonna want one too. Like, that is not productive. And if you talk to a land manager, this makes us look like fools. This, this constant debate. And so we can't stop it, but we can all hold up our right hand and pledge that we're not going to do it. And then get involved with the trail, trail group. They're the ones that are going to solve this for us all. Remember Obama just dropped, dropped the mic? I don't think I'll do that. That's me. I'm not.